Hi, I'm Bob Gimlin. It was in December of 1965. A sonic boom turned people's attention to the late afternoon sky, where a large, fiery object was seen hurtling from Ontario to Pennsylvania. The fireball was seen from Canada and six states. Falling debris from the object started a series of grass fires in northern Ohio and Michigan. At 6.30 p.m., a woman named Frances Kelp in Westmoreland County, Pennsylvania, reported that an object fell from the sky and landed in the woods nearby her house. She thought it was a fallen meteor or a downed aircraft. She went to investigate, but as she approached, its shape and pulsating glow made her reconsider. She called WHJB Radio's John Murphy. She described an object shaped like a, quote, four-pointed star, and that it appeared to be either on fire or glowing. Murphy called the police on the witness's behalf and headed to the area himself. According to the Greensburg Tribune Review headline story from December 10, 1965, Murphy and first responding volunteer firefighters witnessed a glowing, quote, acorn-shaped craft on the ground, decorated with what was described as, quote, stylized hieroglyphs. The Pennsylvania State Police would divulge nothing more than, quote, we are unequipped for this, and we have contacted the military. The military arrived on scene and hauled something out on a flatbed truck. Several newspapers were told by unnamed or unsighted military sources that, quote, we found nothing and called off the search. The problem being that John Murphy, the radio host and one of the first on the scene, took pictures of the, quote, nothing, and he also interviewed various first responders and witnesses. After the photos were developed, WHJB radio office manager described one of the photographs as, quote, it was very dark, and it was with a lot of trees around and everything. I don't know how far away from the site he was, but I did see a picture of a sort of cone-like thing. Two weeks after the incident, Murphy was hard at work on a documentary of the occurrence when the radio station was visited by stern men in black suits. Behind a closed door, they held a meeting with Murphy that lasted approximately an hour. The agents left with his photographs, audio, and partially complete documentary. Murphy said that the men in dark suits would return the material after it had been examined and copied but he never saw them again. Years later, an author named Patty Wilson would track down WHJB employee Linda Frosha, who was there the day the men in dark suits came. Frosha recalls that the documentary that Murphy ended up producing makes no mention of ever actually locating an object of any kind. According to Murphy's wife and co-workers, he became, quote, despondent. Sometime later, Murphy was killed in what was called a hit-and-run. A criminal investigation failed to yield any suspects or results. Regardless of what the military told the papers, there is a consensus that some kind of manufactured object fell from space into that East Coast forest on that December evening. And in 1965, the object could really only have been American, Russian, or neither. When researching this incident, which has come to be known as the Kecksburg Crash, you will inevitably find this matter. So I need to comment on it, or else a bunch of people will comment on how I didn't comment on it. The bell, allegedly, is a nine-foot diameter heavy metal bell-shaped shield made of lead designed to insulate vials of red mercury that, when accelerated and diffused, causes a molecular decomposition within a given range. Again, allegedly, the device would decompose nearby biological or organic matter into a greasy substance. And something about its function causes, quote, anti-gravity propulsion. The problem with this being, basically all of it, the source of the existence of the Nazi bell is this Polish man, Igor Witkowski. Witkowski was an underwriter for a publishing company when he claims to have been abducted by an unnamed Polish military organization that verbally disclosed a bunch of information regarding Nazi UFO secrets, and then threatened that he isn't allowed to tell anyone. 
Witkowski had not been accepted, even by the remote fringes, until he found a most accepting megaphone. But indeed, some aspects of the story are true. He asserts that the bell came from Project Giant, and that certainly did exist. And it indeed was a maniacal and mysterious Nazi weapon plant and ideological think tank sprawling seven subterranean bunkers carved into the Owl Mountains of Poland. Powered by slaves and fueled by the desperation of a rapidly failing war effort. So that much is true. Also, senior group leader Hans Kammler, a director of the weapons facilities for Project Giant, likely defected to the United States, among others like Von Braun, under Operation Paperclip. So the United States certainly did receive Nazi technology. And the final kernel of truth. Kammler detonated the remaining V-1 rockets and blew much of the mountain fortress to bits. This was in direct defiance of an order to withdraw and reinforce Berlin. Orders given in the final days of the war. Witkowski and others assert that Kammler demolished much of Project Giant to destroy secret weapons. But more than likely, Kammler detonated the missiles to bring a swift end to a war that he had every intention of surrendering and surviving. Aside from Witkowski's alleged conversation with an unknown Polish service, there is no evidence of the bell, its irradiating effects, or its anti-gravitational properties. And there is no substance, known or theoretical, as red mercury. Anyway, the government was uncharacteristically efficient in the concealing of whatever crashed in Pennsylvania. Just maybe, because they had practice 13 years earlier. September 12, 1952, a bright object fell from the sky and landed in Braxton County, West Virginia. A local beautician named Mrs. May was worried that she had witnessed a plane crash and set out to assist a potential fallen pilot, who may be in need of some attention. Mrs. May had her two sons and three other children in her care at the time, and the kids refused to stay in the house. On the trail up the hill, on property belonging to G. Bailey Fisher, 17-year-old National Guardsman named Jean Lemon met up with May and the children. Lemon was reacting to what he also believed was a fallen airplane. The guardsman also mentioned that his family's radio lost signal minutes before he saw and felt the crash impact. A quarter of a mile up the path, they saw a pulsating, quote, ball of fire, which curiously didn't cast much light beyond the actual object itself, and each step closer brought an acrid, pungent scent that burned their noses and eyes. The guardsman's dog ran ahead, only to return the way he came, down the trail and out of the woods at a sprint. Immediately after the dog's retreat, the guardsman shined his flashlight at the two glowing lights. Turns out the lights were eyes, and they belonged to something that looked like this. Here is Jean Lemon, beside the beautician Mrs. May, with their sketch of what they witnessed. The quote, whatever it is, was clearly in a suit of some type, described as a metallic skirt that phased between the color of nickel oxide green and pure black. There was only a faint outline of a head encased in a cowling or hood that was described as having the shape of a spade. The creature was described by Mrs. May and the guardsman as about seven feet tall, while the younger witnesses described it as ten feet tall, which is an expected inconsistency. The being was only witnessed for a moment before the party fled, but the guardsman reported that it was darting towards another small red light near the glowing object. After returning to the house, completing the distance much faster this time, I'd expect, Mrs. May called the police. Sheriff Carr and Deputy Long arrived on scene, followed by co-owner and reporter of the local newspaper, Braxton County Observer, a man named A. Lee Stewart. Stewart was contacted, unrelated to May's party. Very long story short, the three men could only corroborate three points of the supposed encounter. There was indeed a, quote, noxious, pungent, sickening odor, as stated by Sheriff Carr. May, Lemon, and two of the kids 
were suffering symptoms of the fumes, and the witnesses were approaching hysteria. But no lights, no eyes, no creature or craft, not even a scuff on the ground. The symptoms were so severe that the guardsmen and two of the five children required hospitalization. Matthew Kennedy, author of Unexplained, actually tracked down Clarksville Hospital staff who were present that night. The three patients were treated in a manner consistent with, quote, victims of exposure to mustard gas. Oddly enough, a group called the Civilian Saucer Investigation, based in Los Angeles, reached out to the Braxton County Observer and gave documentation of a report they had received one week prior, also from Braxton County, where a 21-year-old was treated for symptoms of mustard gas as well. After she investigated a, quote, bouncing light on her property, she was hospitalized for two weeks, presumably because she saw no creature and therefore was on scene longer than the guardsmen or the children. The director of the Board of Education for Braxton County School reported seeing a, quote, flying saucer dash through the sky at 6.30 a.m. on September 13th, the morning after the encounter. Apparently, he was unaware of the events of the previous night at the time of his sighting. Allegedly, there was a discreet military presence on scene for the weeks following, but that is as expected as it is unsubstantiated. Of course, it is hard to substantiate any of this at all, which should surprise no one. But what really grinds my gears is the skeptic's take on these matters, particularly this one. In an article from Skeptical Inquirer from the year 2000, skeptic Joe Nichols writes how his investigative research indicates that something did in fact agitate the witnesses. His explanation? A small brush fire from a small meteorite caused the glow and a barn owl was responsible for the creature sighting, and this barn owl caused such panic that two children and a National Guardsman were hospitalized from the mental trauma and hysterical onset caused by this small fire and owl. Case closed, I guess. Barn owls are creepy, I concede that, but even two of the most vivid imaginations would be hard-pressed to confuse this with an owl. I want to make a few statements, and let you do with them what you will. Werner von Braun, the rocket scientist behind the Nazi V-2 rockets and eventual defector to the United States, is largely responsible for the technology that would eventually put mankind on the moon. Letters have surfaced. Von Braun's mother wrote to her sister, wherein she describes little von Braun as being, quote, wildly imaginative and constantly indulging in, quote, fantasies like putting men on the moon. Not so long ago, this was fantasy. Even the mother of the man who did it thought so. But it's no fantasy now. Meaning it never really was fantasy at all. Again, unsubstantiated as is expected, the suburban-sized, quote, weather balloon that ostensibly fell to Earth confused the first responders and witnesses in Roswell, New Mexico back in the 40s. Allegedly, the craft did not have a single button, dial, switch, or lever. How can anyone operate a device with no buttons? Must be science fiction. Traveling at the speed of light and faster is theoretically possible. Theoretically possible meaning possible. We know galaxies travel faster than light. The problem is, it is unknown how to create enough energy in a contained and efficient way. The amount of energy required is often described in quantitative terms of hydrogen bombs per second. So we are at least in the ballpark in terms of producing the energy requirements for intergalactic travel, though experimentation would likely result in a nuclear winter. So intergalactic travel, currently, is fantasy. His fantasy. His fantasy. His fantasy. We inhabit a time and space that has limitlessly expanding potential for possibility. And in my opinion, many of these possibilities seem even more probable than barn owls. 
Anyway, like and subscribe. And as always, thanks an awful lot for listening.